our classroom. Let me just advance us in the slides here um, while Michelle jumps over to the conversation. So our goals of our presentation today are to make sure that we are sharing a little bit about how Merrimack Valley Middle School has partnered with 4-H. So that's myself as an educator in the classroom here at the middle school. Um, and then Michelle with the corporate extension at 4-H um, and UNH and how we have teamed to bring this enrichment program to our school. Um, Michelle and I started last year. Very briefly, um, we had done some summer planning and thought about how to bring hydroponics into the classroom as an exploratory class here in the middle school. And then through COVID and remote learning, the exploratory option was no longer an opportunity for us in our building. Um, so I then as a special educator thought, you know, this is really a resource that I can accommodate and modify for many of my students and still run this in our resource room. As an extra piece of learning, writing and reading, working on individual goals. Um, so we did just that in a very modified application. So that is very important as one of our goals today that many of the things Michelle and I are doing in the classroom and with hydroponics, aquaponics, aeroponics um, can be modified specifically for your need and your scale in your classroom. So I want that to be um, kind of the big point. Don't be intimidated by it, it's all new, but there are so many educational foundations that we can tie into the hydroponic learning um, that we can bring into any classroom. It does not have to be a science-based classroom that we can do this in. Um, so I'm excited to hear, like Trisha, um, other resources and things that you're bringing in to families and supports throughout the community. Another goal for today, um, what impact has our partnership had and have for students and our faculty in the building? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. Provide a sample of what has been included and given to some of you as a hands-on activity um, and what that has looked like for us as an activity in the classroom. And you'll see, I have some of that sitting behind me here in our vertical system and our aquaponic system. Um, so just here in our science classroom and my exploratory class, we're teaching um, actually in a social studies classroom. So again, it can be very modified to what, whatever setting you have. Explain and make sure that we've learned from our experience and what we have learned, both Michelle and I teaming together um, and then working here with administrators in my building and then sharing how to project, the project has uh, continued. So as well as the exploratory class, um, this for me has expanded from hydroponics into wetland science and then bringing along more of our scientific standards for many of our kids within the exploratory class. And then sharing what resources are available to support in the classroom. Um, so I certainly have my school-based curriculum, um, school-based resources, but then hugely important was teaming with Michelle and 4-H and the extension programs um, for grant funding. That Michelle was a tremendous resource in, in writing and securing for us here in the building to make sure we could get those materials for the classrooms. Um, not only for my exploratory, but also for our sixth grade science curriculum and a, a broader aspect of students in the building. And time for you to share what experiences you've had in the classroom. Um, and we just did a little bit about that, but if we have time at the end, we certainly will expand on that. Do you wanna to add to goals? No, um, I think we've covered that. But I, did, I got a chance to look through the chat and stuff too, and it looks like we have a wide range. Um, I saw the gamut from high school um, through to kindergarten and preschool um, learning. And so at the end, I do have um, some resources that I have, um, some curriculums as far as suggestions um, to be able to use um, with those different grade levels. So what we will talk about and touch upon that, um, it'll look like a variety um, of experiences too, um, from some that are working with hydroponics, aquaponics, aeroponics, um, to those that aren't working at all um, and working in settings outside of the classroom and bringing into the classroom, um, that farm to table concept, um, lots of ideas around that. And I think that there's a lot of synergy in this particular group here and stuff. So I think that there's a lot that we can all share together um, between the work that we've done and seen and have heard about, um, as well as what you guys all have going on. So I'm excited um, to get going and roll through this and hear not only what Kristen and I have to share, but what you, yeah, you guys have to share. And I think that we can build on that. So. Um, I'm hoping that it's, it's a two-way street here. It's not just about us talking to you, but um, all of us able to share. So that being said, please absolutely jump in, ask questions throughout, um, share things that you have found worked or didn't work for those of you who have experience integrating some of this in your classrooms or whatever setting you're working in um, so that we can make sure everybody's 
hearing other things that are happening today. All right, how do I hide this? I'm a Google chat person, not a Google, a Zoom. Whoops, oh, too far ahead. Whoa, Kristen is jumping way Sorry, ahead. guys. <laughs> I run Google Meet, not Zoom. <laughs> so our classroom and 4-H partnership. Um, I said a little bit about Michelle and I teaming together, um, and she'll talk just a little bit about 4-H and that extension, and then our connection to delivering this model within our science curriculum and our state standards. Yeah. Um, so, and the, forgive me if um, I know I can't see how much you can see of me versus X. I don't know where our yeah. preview. I don't see our preview. I think it came up in this. If we go to this, and I'm, a, I'm a standing person versus us. Okay. So and I can switch seats. So I can sit. I'll sit, which will control my movement on you. There we go. Okay. Um, so I was lucky enough that um, Kristen here, which. Um, if you haven't told that Kristen and I have a great relationship inside and outside of the classroom or two. So you will see a little bit of that between us, um, which was wonderful as far as this partnership goes. And she was um, crazy enough to jump on the train when I came to her with this idea. So um, I work in the world of um, outside of the time, outside of the school class time um, education. And so 4-H, for those of you who aren't familiar, if uh, I know I have a few extension um, colleagues around who may, who probably are very familiar with 4-H, and I know I have a 4-H, some 4-H volunteers are on um, and past staff members. Um, so you're probably very familiar with what I'm talking about, but 4-H, we're around, we are grounded in, um, we have a school enrichment delivery model. Um, it's not, in New Hampshire, it isn't one of our um, most our largest delivery model, our club model is our largest delivery model here in New Hampshire, um, but it is still a delivery model for us and one that we are growing. Um, and we do, all of our curriculums are aligned to um, the next generation science standards, state standards. So we are coming from a research-based curriculum. Um, so we do align well with classroom, um, that classroom matchup. Um, and all of our um, work is done, it's, it's a hands-on experiential approach. Um, and within that structure and support, often a volunteer or mentor um, support is available. And so in this particular instance, when I was piloting this with, it was myself working directly with Kristen and piloting this um, mm -hmm. for this workshop. Um, since then, we've built out a structure where there's actually additional mentors around the state available to help support classrooms in this. So in many of our models in school enrichment, that's not always um, just a teacher delivering. It's often in conjunction with a 4-H volunteer who's trained in the curriculum to help support um, teachers, um, depending upon what, how um, comfortable a teacher is or isn't with the actual material that we're talking about. Um, and so that piece, is really important when we talk about this partnership um, because coming in and working with Kristen, um, there was already that natural fit as far as what I was talking about and coming in with as far as the curriculum that we were talking about and what I wanted to work with for activities already aligned to the work that she was doing here in the classroom and, uh, and having that match up as far as where she was at in scope and sequence with what she was doing. Can I jump in on that? Yep. So in addition to some of the curriculum standards that I mentioned that I had started this in a special ed classroom um, and a resource room, and, and then teaming with our sixth grade team, um, our science teachers now here in the building are running a larger unit that is also supported by those mentors from UNH um, and then Michelle herself. So they have a number of materials that are um, materials, and each student is gonna get an individual system that they'll be running um, and testing. So at each level, those standards, the science, science standards um, are met through this curriculum, both in the scientific data process and um, ex exploring inquiry-based standard, um, and then aligning with our individual sixth grade standards. Um, but this could certainly be extended, expanded throughout high school level, um, in addition to other programs that are not necessarily a standards-based or curriculum-based program. So specific to New Hampshire here and what we've done, um, that's kind of how we got started and brought this into our classrooms and then expanding to our science curriculum. Um, but it certainly can be molded and adapted. And each individual lesson that Michelle said, we're going to share a folder with you with some of those resources and materials um, can easily, easily be modified for different age levels. 
Um, and if at any point you're looking through some of those materials and you're like, man, I just don't have a scientific background to add to this, or I have no idea how I could accommodate this in my fifth grade classroom versus a science specific classroom, um, certainly reach out to Michelle and I, and we'd be happy to help you with accommodations or modifying the lesson so that anyone can access it. I think, and the other part, that last bullet on this is grant. Um, so the work that Kristen and I did, um, knowing that we, so I think someone asked about um, hydroponics and going into it being an expensive endeavor. And so hydroponics can be an expensive endeavor. However, I can tell you that I've done it, um, I've kind of done the spectrum on it. Um, so actually this winter I ran um, with COVID and such, um, a virtual hydroponics club um, as actually an agroscience club. We did it three agroscience um, curriculums and hydroponics was one of them. And so hydroponics on the least expensive side at a $30 per youth um, exploratory with them. Um, and so parts of those um, experiences actually we did do here in the classroom too. And we'll be able to share, um, there's some pictures coming up and as well as there's also some units here in the background here that we have that were a piece of that. So it doesn't have to be expensive to start off at an individual student level and to be able to interject the pieces and the grounding of hydroponics. Um, but we were aiming a little bit higher here in the classroom and we knew we wanted to create a sustain sustainable piece here um, and carry it on. So we did go after a little bit of funding. So we applied to the CHS Foundation um, and received $500 grant um, to purchase some pieces um, out of Alaska Ag in the Classroom has an indoor um, hydroponics curriculum that is free and downloadable. Um, and so don't worry about catching some of these, um, all of these resources we talk about. So after the, after this workshop, I do have all of these resources in a nice listed out linked form that I will send out to everybody. Um, but Ag in the Classroom is an amazing um, network of also resources too, along with 4-H. So they also have a wonderful matrix of curriculums that are searchable as well. Um, they had a wonderful curriculum that I had taken, um, had adapted some stuff from there as, as well and utilized as, from that. Um, and they in theirs had um, a, a design um, protocol for a vertical unit. And so we utilize that. It's over here in the corner. Oh, oh no. Oh. I don't want to unplug it. I want to unplug you. Yep. So it is built over here in the corner. It is in use. Um, so we use the funding to help provide to get the pieces for that um, and to keep that as a sustainable piece here for them to, um, to be able to use year after year. Um, so Ag in the Classroom also in each state has that. They also have funding streams available for classrooms to implement projects like this as well. Um, Master Gardeners here, particularly for those that are here in New Hampshire, um, that program, they do have a funding source as well. And if you, some of those master gardeners are interested in hydroponics, and if they team with you in the classroom, are able to provide funds as well. Um, and that program is not just um, specific here to New Hampshire. There are other states that have that type of a program and maybe a funding source as well. In addition to those, um, there are other funding sources available too, especially around school gardening, hydroponics, that. So there is funding opportunities to help support um, hydroponics in the classroom for sure. Um, so it's resources, they're, they're there um, and they're available and partnering with your 4-H, local 4-H person can help you to identify some of those. And I eventually, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> apparently touchy, whoa, whoa, Kristen, Kristen, Kristen. I, have a two I, here. I think it happened last time I did this on her computer too. <laughs> okay. So um, we talked about a couple of these quick like, so I'll go quickly over the screen, but benefits of partnering with 4-H um, that just from that research-based curriculum side of things, experiential hands-on learning, bringing that hands-on piece into the classroom and helping to do that um, aligned to national standards as well as state standards. We've talked about that, um, but extending opportunities beyond the classroom Community connections, um, which has been a piece that we've capitalized here in our programming, um, connections beyond. So a lot of times for us here in our community, we have a large grower down in Loudoun. Um, Leaf Farms is a large hydroponic grower, grower of um, lettuce, which um, is, a person, is a company that I've done programming with and also have been able to help 
Kristen said, I want to do a field trip there. Great. We can help make those connections. Um, so you'll often find that your, your 4-H partner is often well-connected in the community, especially around your agricultural type topics. Um, it's a stronghold for us. It's a very niche, one of our strong um, backgrounds. So it can be one of those areas where you can help and enhance and enrich your your classroom opportunity your classroom learning into that outside connection um, there's a connection to the 4-h programs um, so that chance for to take the learning that you're doing in a classroom and to bring it out into the community um, and extend it beyond the classroom so for Kristen in this particular example when her students are if they get really deeply interested in hydroponics in here and it happens there's a chance to bring that out into a club. Um, so we have clubs around the state that are doing project work. And some of that project work is around gardening, hydroponics and such. Um, and so to continue that learning outside of school time with other like-minded peers um, in specifically that area. And then to take that on to county level programming, club level, it goes club level programming, county, regional level programming, and sometimes onto national opportunities. Um, and so actually specifically out of this school in particular, I've had students that have gone in a maple program and actually done a, na a national um, maple presentation around maple sugaring. Um, so very excited for them around that particular project. Um, so there's opportunity to grow their learning beyond the classroom and what they're doing here and to take that um, and potentially, hopefully maybe careers around that and some career exploration. And um, then always underlying in those um, in the project that work that we're doing is that life skill development, which was really evident. And when Kristen and I sat down to do some of our planning, we were looking at the scope and sequence of what we had planned out. And she's looking at it and she's saying, well, this is great in this activity that you have laid out here because we were looking at the design of the six general hydroponic type of units and it had around researching out the units and, you know, how would you kind of do um, build out your own unit um, and it really nicely fit into the skill development of the research and understanding resources and utilizing that because that was also um, skills that they were utilizing in the other classes that they were doing. So it really dovetailed nicely with, with um, in supporting the, the skills that they were developing here at school. So in particular for me, I, I actually had students who were in a life skills resource room um, as far as a special ed identification that were then advocating for themselves in their research unit in their sixth grade ELA classroom that my research project is now going to be based on my hydroponics learning and all of my research and skills that I'm, I'm learning as far as resources and scientific data. Um, what's a good resource? What's a not? What's, what's not? How do I find out if it's scientific based? Um, and they geared this specifically towards the hydroponic learning. And for some of them, it has now led to them taking this as an exploratory rather than just as a extra unit in their life skills classrooms. I actually think the next one is yours. All right. So we're going to jump a little bit into, I guess, let's kind of pause here and just make sure anybody with questions, um, Michelle is going to jump on her chat as well questions to how we have integrated this into the classroom, what teaming with the 4-H and school-based programming has looked like, um, questions you have about that, questions about grant funds. Um, and then we're going to kind of jump over to what hydroponics looks like and how this has looked in the classroom and some of that lesson planning and things that we've done specifically in the sixth grade classroom. So I'm going to stop talking for a minute. So working with parks and rec program to hold a year round garden based pre-K pro yay young kids and looking at how can be a wintertime activity. Oh, yes. Um, so here in Merrimack Valley at our school. So we are New Hampshire based uh, negative 12 degrees here this morning and gardening is not happening for us in the winter. Um, Trisha, I see you're shaking your head. Yeah. Freezing cold, right? Um, you guys are probably experiencing similar temperatures right now. Maybe. No. Okay. Um, so for us, I started this, um, we are running on a trimester schedule and I started the programming in the spring, uh, incorporating a bit of wetlands outside as well as then we built our first hydroponic unit, which is the vertical unit behind me. Um, and then each trimester I have left it up to the students specifically decide if we're running one leg, all three legs. Um, if we are swapping and running our aquaponic unit, which they just planted in um, on Thursday. And then the smaller ones in the back, we have our test tube 
um, kits and then the passive bottle systems. So all things that they've had an experience in within the classroom. Um, so, and all winter based, we ran it in our greenhouse here on campus um, in the spring, which was great until about November. And then our school board said, sorry, we're not heating that anymore. <laughs> so we brought it into a classroom and um, it's been working just fine. It's currently sitting in my co-teaching um, science classroom. So we have a little bit more counter space and some outlets um, and we come in and visit during the exploratory time and, and do the work we need to in here. It also gives us direct access to the sinks, a little bit more counter space for testing, um, adding nutrients to those systems. Let's see, whoa. Solid waste planner, ooh. New personal knowledge of hydroponics incorporating into the local school show. Okay, yeah, so running certainly as a specific unit or even a week of summer camp, that could be um, a small unit or just a hydroponic unit. Um, so cold, yes, it is cold, Robin, very cold. It's supposed to get better midweek. Science educator training, training in North Carolina. So Sarah, do you know Michelle? If not, I would encourage you to reach out independently after as well. Teach cooking, awesome. Um, so I have kind of reached out a little bit here in our district as to um, our food services coordinator and how we could integrate some of the material we are growing and the, the produce we're growing. We have not gone large scale enough yet to provide um, greens that we could then feed students with. Uh, I would love to go that way and I am excited to share next year I'm headed to a, a full-time science classroom. Um, so Michelle and I will be expanding our <laughs> opportunities and expanding what we can do in the classroom. So hopefully long-term, we would definitely will be taking that into a food services role. Um, maybe even running a unit down in our cafeteria, who knows, but the opportunities are endless and the opportunities that Michelle has brought to us here in the, the school are, um, really endless. That's you throw out an idea and she's willing to get funding and support us with material and, um, jump in. And as an educator, that has been huge. Um, I know we often get stuck in our standards and what are we providing and how are we meeting our standards? So to then have material literally given to me and supported with a resource or a mentor in the classroom um, has been huge. And I know the other two science educators that I work with are like, oh my gosh, we actually can run something extra and hands-on um, rather than just stuck in our daily ways and our routines of making sure we hit all of those standards. So a quick review, hydroponics. Um, I'm hopeful that you're coming here having some understanding, hydro being water, ponics, the root systems. Um, so what is our plant system looking like? And then hydroponic being that we are supporting the nutrient base of the system um, and our plants in water rather than in soil media. Um, so this is one of the specific lessons we have started with and just introducing kids specifically at that sixth grade level to what are plants, what do they need, and then more specifically, what specific nutrients do they need and where are they getting that from? Um, and then how do we add that in a hydroponic unit? Why are we not advancing now? There we go. So these are some pictures of, again, the units I have right behind me. Um, we have our aquaponic unit and our liter bottle units. So this is a, a soda bottle that's been cut. It has a wicking system underneath. And then you can see the different types of media that students then got to um, test for different absorption of water and decide what they wanted to grow um, in their unit. So again, they had done a little bit of a research project um, in conjunction with some of their ELA research, learning how to specifically scientifically research and then provide the data to back up their decision. And we built the passive systems with the wicking unit. Um, and then they've also gotten the opportunity to experience with the aquaponic systems. Um, so providing the nutrient with the fish, the fish feed from the nutrient from the plant, and then it's a filtering system that runs through. So this one provided from Amazon, funds from Michelle that she supported with us um, in those grants. And then this direct material that Michelle was able to provide us in the classroom um, and again, each individual student got to build their specific unit 
and make their choices on the media they were using. So most systems are kept indoors. Like I said, we had the opportunity to run this in our greenhouse. Um, it's then flexible enough that we are now running it on a countertop inside. Um, you know, we're using a different timer setting to run our, our light systems back here, which you can see in the picture. Um, very portable, very adaptable, but again, we're on the small setting. Um, so we could certainly scale it up and, and I can work with our school board and run it in our greenhouse. So it's definitely what you have available for you as a resource um, to get yourself started. And those of you on the home unit, um, I would encourage you to try a small system first and kind of see how it goes and, and what testing the different pH levels and nutrients are like in your systems um, and then see how that goes for you. I know personally running some of the smaller systems, it's been easier to manage as far as understanding what my plants specifically need versus now running kind of our larger systems. Um, and you can kind of see like this plant is kind of struggling, not really getting the nutrients it's needing, um, but this is all providing a learning opportunity for my students who are then also seeing their rather healthy plant um, and they're testing two different medias in this case. So testing rock wool and testing clay beads. Um, as a media. Do you want to add anything to that? Um, no. So the only other thing I would add is that um, if you, the, the individual um, one liter bottle units that are pictured here, um, if you were looking for a, a piece for your students to have kind of an at home um, piece for them to have ownership of. Um, this That would be a great piece for them to take home. Um, I have done that in a remote setting, both with schools as well as um, in the out of school setting. Um, and that's been a piece that we've used, utilized at home. It's actually been a piece I've done fully online um, and led 55 youth through as far as um, through a series of four, no, five, um, five sets of activities through on a totally remote setting. Um, so that piece um, is a great opportunity if you want that kind of at home ownership of it for them to be able to take home, engage with families with that too. Um, I would say that that would, that would be a piece you would take out of the classroom if you're looking for that kind of a, a, a built in piece to your programming to think about that. And to just kind of adding to that for some of you who are, you know, the EBT and providing the SNAP program, um, providing food at home, this specifically, the kids have grown basil and they have taken home a basil plant that they are still, I have students who started in September, are still using it. I had one last week was like, I, I used basil in my spaghetti sauce with my mom this weekend. Um, so it is providing a source and it's certainly something that they could then go larger scale at home. And I know here through our student services programming, um, we have other resources that a family could also have outside community funding to support them in that kind of a, a grow unit at home, mm -hmm. um, specifically if it was providing them with a food resource. And if you thought about pairing hydroponics with your Choose Health Food Fund Fitness for SNAP Ed, um, could be a nice pairing as far as that food security and um, case for programming. Because I think that is still a approved curriculum for, your, for the SNAP Ed funding source. Could be wrong. Heidi could totally correct me on that if, it, if I'm off on that, but I think so. So what does this all mean, hydroponics? Um, I heard some of you say you've been doing a little bit of aeroponics. Some of you have done the aquaponics. Um, so each of them is that plants are growing in something other than a soil media. Uh, um, and that they are in fact getting their nutrients from the water. So again, this is one of the resources and materials that we are using um, as our intro lesson right in the classroom. So introducing students to what the different systems can look like, whether it's a drip system, a passive system, um, what many of my kids call the flood and drain system, um, just vocabulary based, <laughs> they're struggling a little bit. And then what we're doing in the, the systems, um, so pumping water into the root system, allowing them to soak and absorb the nutrients that we are adding into the water resource and then filtering or functioning, whether it's a drip system um, or flood system um, into the plant. And we talk a little bit about what plants need, their place, their lights, their air, nutrients, um, their water, and then soil and we take that away. So then how do we get the soil to our plants? Um, 
have also started, um, depending upon, some people have also started to use a little bit of this. Um, the Ackerman is nice because plants, it lines right up with um, what we're studying, um, but also have started to use a little bit of the acronym lawns, if anybody has learned that, um, because it takes the word soil out of the picture, but still gets the other components of what a plant needs. Um, so there um, could create less confusion. So depending on where you are and where you want to go and what your student is, um, that is another acronym that could um, be substituted just with helping them to remember what plants need um, and where you want to go. Okay. So you knew it was coming. We want to do hands-on, right? So some of you um, may have material at home, some may not. Um, so we're kind of going to do this a little bit as a, um, for those that do have the activity, have material at home, I'd like you to be able to grab that or in your school setting or wherever you are, home, if you're, wherever you are, um, to grab those materials. For those that don't, I do have the materials here, so I'll show you it um, so you'll be able to see it. Um, and those that do have it, would like you to be able to do the activity at home. And then um, I think there's so few of you that we would like you to be able to share your results because what we did do when we sent the material out to those of you, um, not everybody got the same material so that there is a comparison and you can provide um, kind of um, that picture of what the differences are between the materials. Um, so the activity that we chose to share with everybody and send the materials home for is um, a sample of our grow medium activity. And so in this activity, the students themselves, when we do this activity, they get um, at least three different grow mediums that they test. Um, Kristen in her classroom, I think has actually been doing up to six materials that they test. Uh, each student has individually. And so the idea behind this is when they, when we talk about it, we talk about grow mediums um, having different characteristics. And so we talk about what kind of characteristics we want a grow medium to have. And then, but, and water absorption or retention is one of those. And so we want grow mediums to be able to retain water. So because those are the, that's material that's right around our, those roots um, in our in our plants and that system, but we also don't want it to keep too much water. Um, and we talk about that, the reasoning behind that, that we, if, a, if it keeps too much water, then we can have also run the possibility of rotting our plants out, providing way too much nutrients, which happens to a few of these, if you saw a sample of that, um, they're having some trouble with. Um, so it's really a balance. And so this activity gives the chance for the students to get hands-on with, several different types of materials to touch, to feel, to really explore that material, to describe it. So there, there's a little bit of an observational piece there. Um, and then to test the property of it, the water retention property of it, and then to make an educated guess or an educated decision on their own. So this is where Kristen said they get, they get to make the decision what grow medium they wanna use or test out in their system. So once they know what the water retention or absorption rate is of the grow medium, and then they also know what they're growing for a plant themselves, they can decide, okay, I really liked how the cocoa, cocoa fiber did or did not retain water. So I'm going to use that. Or I want to mix it up. I want to use cocoa fiber with hydroclay and see what that does. So there's a chance for them to kind of create their own scientific experiment from this. So... I'm just gonna adjust one. So quickly in the one liter bottles. So specifically with this particular um, media choice, the students tested each media like some of you are gonna be able to do today. This particular student chose the vermiculite, um, which is the material on the top. So it's a one liter bottle that is then cut in almost half, a little less than half. Um, and we put a wick so the, the cover is drilled with a hole and we put a wick in. This one is from September. It's, it's looking a little rough at this time, but it's a student who departed with us. Um, so the wick is then put into water, which the student has to test pH um, of just our regular tap water and then do a little bit of research about their specific plant and what type of pH it would need and add nutrients. Um, so for us, it looks like floral grow, which is this material right here. Um, again, all provided through us to us through the grant fund um, and the kids measure out. Um, again, scientific standards, measuring, adding, 
um, and they, they add to their material and then they grow. So this particular unit does not have a seed in it any longer. That plant was transplanted to our hydroponic vertical system. Um, but just an example of the very simple, you know, you really don't even need, you could just use your recycled bottle, um, tap water at home. You could certainly experiment with adding different um, nutrients that you have right in your cabinet. Um, and then your unit, your, your material up top could be simply stone from your driveway, um, sand from a sandbox. It's, it can be very, very basic for the students to grow. So, I brought with me today, I have some cocoa husks here with me. Um, so the activity is pretty simple for as far as materials. So need a cup of the grow medium, whatever grow medium that is. Um, I did bring, I brought some paper plates or some kind of surface just to be able to, to lay out the material on um, because we, we encourage the students to, to observe the material um, and to touch it, to feel the texture of it. And I'm, I'm I'm balancing between seeing the material. I'm, I think it's more important to see the material. Um, and so we also provide um, just very simple, easy, cheap um, magnifying glasses for them to be able to look closely at the material. Plastic cup, um, clear. And it needs to be plastic because you are going to put a hole in the bottom of it. Um, and so I tip on this one, um, especially because we do have... Um, educators that are working with a gamut, the whole wide gamut from three to up to high schoolers. Um, so a hole in the bottom. With my young students, I pre put the hole in and I have used, it makes it much easier. You can actually do a pretty good stack of them with a drill bit, a 5 sixteenths drill bit. Um, so take, unless you really want to use your muscles and get them really working, drill bit. But if you don't have that drill by the end, and you if you're doing older students, you can, with a lot of caution and the safety tips, you can use a screwdriver. And I used, this morning, I used just a Phillips head screwdriver on this one. I really give you a couple of safety tips for mine. <laughs> that when I did this this morning, I did not go, anyways, I went, I used it out so that my hands were away from the tip. And I slowly put pressure on and just twisted and worked it until it got through. It took a while, the cup crushes in a little bit. That's okay as long as it doesn't crack because really all it's gonna do is drain water through here. Um, we just don't want the medium to go through um, and I worked it until it goes through and it takes a little bit of time and a little bit of patience. It is doable, um, but not, I, with the younger kids, I really encourage that you have those holes in first. So I will just add to that at a sixth grade level, um, that was certainly all, all of this, the building and construction of their units, cutting their bottles, their one liter bottles. Um, I was able to integrate and take a walk down to our um, STEM classroom where they use hand saws and drills and drill bits and um, with the use of safety equipment and gloves on and goggles on, that was certainly a life skill that those kids were able to acquire. And they drilled all of their own materials. They have cut the PVC, um, they have cut tubing, and their bottles as well. Um, so you again need to kind of think about the, the gamut of kids you're working with and the skills and abilities you're trying to get them to acquire. And so when we do it in the classroom, we use graduated cylinders, um, the activity actually in the, the full pack that we use graduate cylinders for the home activity. I altered the, the instruction sheet that I sent to you and I said um, that you'd be measuring, you grab a measuring cup from at home um, and so I just grabbed, I've, I use this for another activity, just a lovely plastic measuring cup that we have. Um, Cause you'd be measuring out, I said, and I changed it from hundred milliliters to a heavy half a cup that we'd be measuring for water. Um, so in the actual activity, it's hundred milliliters and more on the, more of the science-based um, tools that we use. But for at home, I kept it simple for what you probably would have home. Um, just thinking if you were at the yeah, at home environment, because it, unfortunately could not mail everybody graduated cylinders. Um, and then also from at home um, that you would need a bowl. It's very important, especially when I do this with youth and I'm the one instructing that when we put a hole in a cup, we're gonna have water go through this, that that cup is always gonna be sitting in a bowl. Um, we don't want any accidents. And so the other thing I try to always make sure I grab, just in case is to have really handily is some paper towels. 
Um, and actually at the end, you will want some paper towels handy when we go to take the medium out of the bowl to measure the water out after to have that a place to put your cup um, to rest because there'll be, still be some water draining out at the end, even after the three minutes. So personally, the first round of, of testing when we did the grow medium, um, we did this outside in September here in New Hampshire. It was a warm, beautiful day and we didn't really worry about making a mess and the kids really got to get hands on. They were using scientific materials outside um, and that, that made it just that much more fun. We didn't have to worry about cleaning up a classroom after. Um, so just a tidbit. So just to give you a sample, so if you're at home or in your school setting or wherever you are and you have the materials, I would encourage you to go ahead and get that material out. Um, and to go ahead, I'm gonna walk the rest of it through it. Um, like you can see the material. I'm gonna choose, I'm gonna choose cocoa husks. Um, the, other, the other material that you may have if you've got a metal packet was some hydro clay or possibly vermiculite, I think was the other material that we sent um, in the packet. Um, manipulate a little bit like this um, can be a little bit dustier. Um, it kind of feels like styrofoam. But all are very common grow mediums in the hydro um, product system. So the first step that we encourage our students to do is to take that material out and just to take a little bit of it out and just to, to play with it, actually, really, you know, get hands on with it. Um, so the other piece that came out, and I, I did it. No. So I'm going to go a couple ahead and we'll go back. Okay, so I'm going to stick with that because I did put it in here. So on the left is the Grow Medium Investigation Sheet. Um, and so if you got a mail home pa activity packet, this is there. So this is the um, the sheet that we use with the youth. Um, and so you'll notice um, that the columns, the uniform size of fibers for your debris and the weight. So those are all characteristics that we talk about in the informational part when we're with that leads up into this activity. So again, you're getting a, we wouldn't do this activity without some pre-information into it. Um, so that part, you would, we would have already talked to them about. Um, and so they would be, we would have them write up the type that they were testing, and then they would be describing as they're playing with this, they would be recording what they're, what they see for the unified size of fibers. Is it free, is it free debris? So like I tell them, so we're looking at cocoa husks here. Do we have just cocoa husks or do we have frog legs in there? Like, is it just what it is or do we have something else in there? Um, and so they're they're doing that judgment on that and weight, is it lightweight? Which is one of the beautiful things about hydroponics versus a traditional farming system or growing system. These materials are much lighter than going out and digging up mounds of soil. Um, it's a beautiful thing. Um, so to move these around, it's much lighter weighter than a traditional garden bed type system. Again, to add to all of the data investigation forms and the documentation. Um, so Michelle and I work specifically to modify this in their first year for that resource room and life skills room with some students who are not spelling, who are not accurately writing. Um, and we did one data column at a time instead of all three. So these can certainly be modified to make this material work for your classroom. Um, and I'm happy to support modifications if you feel like you need that or just want to have that conversation before you get started in your classroom. Um, if you happen to be a classroom setting or even a camp setting and you're working with different age groups, um, whatever that might be. So as, so as they work through and we observe the material um, and sometimes as they're working through talking to, again, engaging the group and stuff, sometimes there's some conversation not depending upon and, I love to listen when they are observing and you hear them talking about it. Um, it's just great to hear the connections that they're making. Um, and once they're through with those observations, then it gets into the fun part um, because I'm still always amazed at the, the results that we get sometimes. Um, so the directions go that we take a cup of the material. Well, after, so we put the hole in the bottom of the cup. So we, I've already done that. So. If you're at home and you have the materials and you're following along, so you're gonna go ahead and the plastic cup that you've gathered, you're gonna to wanna to put a hole in the bottom of that. Um, so that, and then when you have done that, you're gonna place a cup of the material. So that should be the, 
these are pre-measured bags. So it should be that you should be using the bag worth of what you have. And so the, also the great part about all the materials that were sent home to you, they are all reusable. So after you're done this activity with them, the ones that were sent home, you can actually dry them out on a paper towel or towel and you can reuse them. You can grow in them if you want to, to and try that out. Um, the only material that I have that I have not regrown in is would be rock wool as a single use um, or mineral wool. I have, rock I have wool, regrown in it. Rock it wool being a trade name on it, but um, so putting a cup of grow material in the cup. I'm going to try to do this without making a mess, which may not work. Chris's classroom or Shelby. <laughs> Shelby, likes, Shelby likes me too. So please feel free to jump in with questions um, as Michelle is testing and you guys are walking through it. Especially those of you, if you don't have the material at home or you want to see something more closely or specifically, um, questions, let us know. I'm going to keep one in the chat too. But definitely unmute and jump in. Hey there. So once, yep. Are you able to show the wicking unit a little bit closer? The wicking unit? Yep. Chris will grab that. While she's grabbing that, when the material is in the cup, I'm going to mark the top of it with the Sharpie marker on the outside so that you know where the top level is. And this is to you know any changes that happen after if it compresses um, or anything else once we pour the water through. So just marking the top where it rests with the top on the outside. So this is a very basic wicking unit. This is, again, the one liter bottle um, model. And so wicking in general is just saying that it is wicking, just like a candle wick, um, drawing up the water or the nutrient solution yeah. okay. into the plant. So this is the wick. Literally, um, it can be just about any soft, porous um, string or material, cotton string. This is particularly a hydroponic specific um, wick, okay. but you can certainly use cotton material. You just want to make sure that whatever you are setting it into is absorbing up the string. And then in this case, it's buried in... I don't know if I'm going to be able to show you without dumping it out. Um, it's up into the base sure. of our grow media medium um, so that yeah. it's bringing water to the roots of the plant system. So that being said, wicking is also just general <laughs> and growing then in our vertical unit. Um, there's a couple of different ways we could use wicking. So this particular unit is pumping water um, from the basin or bin on the floor, it's mm -hmm. a simple um, small scale sonic pump. And that then is feeding the top of the vertical unit through the black hosing. Um, and my group of students right now wanted to use this as more of a flood system, except it's a vertical unit. So they <laughs> wanted to see what would happen. And they're gonna find out tomorrow after our PT day today that their plants are already not so happy. Um, so we're gonna have to make some changes, but all part of the inquiry and what do plants need. So first trimester, um, we ran this as a drip system. So this is again, just small hose piping and other small, very flexible piping and a drip unit. Again, all materials that you can get at Home Depot or on Amazon, very basic. Um, they come in different size packages. And this was all able to be done. Um, we're at about $275 worth of my 500 grant right now that Michelle coordinated. Um, so very doable in a classroom. And this hosing then ran into the vertical unit and each specific net cup, which these little cups are the net cups with the grow medium and the plant. Each cup then had the drip unit specifically set into it. So more of a direct water and nutrient drop to each plant. Um, so the students right now are learning which one is growing better, which is bringing more nutrient directly. Um, the other option, which, so I will suggest to them Tuesday to think about how else based on their research of the mini units um, and the different types of hydroponics, how else could they then bring water um, to our vertical system? 
my hope is that with their research on the different types of system and their use of building an already wicking system in the one liter bottle, that they will determine, you know, we can continue to use our flood system, but we need to add a wick to the bottom of our net cup. So when the water floods the vertical pipe, each wick will draw water to the individual plant. Um, so that's wicking system. Um, very much like a candle wick, drawing the wax to the flame. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So this part, I'm going to it. Not, not because I think that you may forget, but also because I'm very used to doing it with the youth too. But now that we have the grow medium in a cup, I, I probably said this about five or six times before I go to the next step is to make sure that this cup now goes into the bowl because from this point on, I don't no accidents with my youth, my students um, with water. So, cause I don't want to pick up any messes. So I make sure at this point that this, that cup is always in the bowl. Um, I keep making sure that they know that. Um, and I say it a few more times from this point on, cup in the bowl with the grow medium. Um, and so then, it's pretty fun. They just simply measure out um, just a heavy half cup of water um, for this particular activity, or if you're doing the graduate cylinders, it calls for 100 milliliters of water. And so I guess that would be the other important part, um, and I have had a few youth pick up on this, um, especially adults, that you want to make sure your bowl is big enough to to contain half cup. at least the half cup of water, if it had to, hopefully is that it wouldn't have to contain a half cup of water because some of it should be absorbed into your grow medium. But certain grow mediums are going to absorb more water than others. Um, so it depends on which one you are. And so then you're gonna just slowly pour, I'm gonna try to balance both, the half cup of water, good thing it's Kristen's computer, <laughs> over the grow medium. And then it says, to wait for three minutes. And so in the three minute time, usually I use it as a great time just to talk to the students, whether they're observing what they saw during for the observation sheet, what they think, make predictions um, as to which ones they think are gonna hold more or not hold more, all of that good stuff. So we'll let our sit, for those at home, hopefully if you're doing this, um, then you can, if you can, um, let us know which one, if you could pop it into the chat, let us know which one, which grow meeting you had and how much water the, um, how much water passed through. So we care about the water that passed, we're gonna care about the water passed through. So to do that at the end of the three minutes, this is where that piece of paper towel comes in importantly, that you lift up, there'll be a little bit of residual water that still comes out of the cup let that mostly just come down to its drip um, and then put it on the paper towel and then pour what water is in the bowl back into the measuring cup and see how much you have left and that's how much water. And then for those, if you're looking for the math side of things for students and they can calculate how much water that the grow medium retained and how much passed through. And then if you want to do percentages you can get into all kinds of fun stuff that way um, in a comparison. And so then we also, depending upon the student or the age of the youth and stuff we talk about, you know, if a grow medium retains a lot of water, if it retains a lot of water, then what does that really mean to us? And what do, why do we care? Um, and so we talk about the plant's needs and that gets further into that. And so if we have a grow medium that retains a lot of water, it's not always right for the, every kind of plant. And so if we think about a strawberry, what kind of soil does a strawberry like to grow in? What kind of conditions? And strawberries um, tend to like a sandier, drier kind of soil. So if a grow medium really retains a lot of water, it may not be the best choice to grow strawberries in. Um, but that grow medium might be a good choice for a cucumber who likes a lot of water and you have to water them a lot. Um, so we get to get talk about that choice and where that's where that different kind of grow medium comes in where you might mix some grow mediums to create that really ideal growing environment. That was also kind of the next step where my students then asked, you know, well, my plant also needs lighting. 
um, what, how do I get that? How am I gonna use that? So we talked about classroom window versus adding artificial lighting. Um, we talked about what can happen in big scale greenhouse lighting um, versus our classroom. So my students, I'm sure are also gonna ask, you know, it's been a long weekend, the lights have been off in the classroom. So do we need to add light to our vertical system? Um, so they'll experiment with an artificial light and add that on a timer. Um, as we're kind of holding and pausing for our folks to jump in with their media testing at home, um, specifically, I'm looking at the chat and the outreach with administration. Uh, can you expand on that question and, and uh, kind of what you're looking for as far as administration? Well, I'm just curious about sort of just access to the school and spaces and just involvement with the administration. Um, where I am, it's like sort of individual schools are so different based on the principal. They'll have us um, doing gardening and cooking in their in their schools. So from my side, from my side for accessing schools. Yeah. Or yeah. To getting access, it can be a little bit tricky. Um, luck, and I have found my best luck has been knowing a teacher. The my best access to a school has been through making a teacher direct contact. Um, and I say that I'll use an example. Um, so I have hydroponics going on here with Kristen, um, which has expanded here. Um, as she alluded to, um, there's now shall be sixth grade science, um, and then Kim is. Sixth grade. Sixth grade as well. So two other teachers have picked up on what we're doing and they have jumped on um, and are jumping into our, we have an AFRI grant through New Hampshire, um, which is doing food systems and hydroponics. Um, and so they are choosing, I think hydroponics for that, um, hydroponics for that um, piece of the grant too. So they're doing some of our other larger grant work. Um, but I have Maple sugaring is another curriculum that I work with. Um, and so I have that going on in two other elementary schools in the county here, in this county. Um, and my connection was just reaching out directly to a teacher. And actually that was a cold call. Um, I just sent out an email to the fourth, I was targeting fourth and fifth grade. And I sent out an email to two teachers in that school. And I said, hey, this is what I have. Would you be willing? And they got back to me. And they've been on board with me for two years now. Um, and not only did they do it, it's been word of mouth because they told the teachers in the next town over, and now I've jumped to their school too. So now I'm supporting four, fourth and fifth grades in the same school district now, and this which actually happens to be this school district as well. Um, so that has been the best access, it's been my access is um, getting to know a teacher um, in that way. And so working, working, just making connects in that way. Um, as far as administration here in the building, as soon as Michelle and I teamed and I learned about some of those opportunities for additional grants and bringing the funds, that was a game changer for me in the classroom. Um, I approached my administrator and said, you know, these are the programs I want to run. Oh, and by the way, I have the funding to do this. Um, so they immediately were like, absolutely go ahead. And then in addition, that has brought more conversation at a district level. Um, what other clubs and programs can we integrate? How can we integrate this into our standards and bring more hands-on learning while we're meeting those classroom specific standards, um, both in science and then in each of our curriculum areas. Um, so we're looking as a district to expand with the conjunction of Michelle and some of those other programmings, um, maple sugaring here on campus, our grow gardens here on campus, um, and then into food service. I have, to say, I have to say one of my other, the other resource that, um, I'm using, and I'm, I can't, I'm apologize because I can't see the whole screen who is actually asking the question necessarily, um, but um, utilizing other resources that are working within school districts. So, um, so I'm working on the forage side, but I have colleagues in Nutrition Connections who are working in classrooms. Um, and so sometimes working our re relationships and knowing what our, both what they're doing and what I'm doing, um, sometimes it's a great connect there too. And so them knowing who they're, that one of their teachers may be interested in very much what I'm doing um, and it makes a good sense. Um, and so sometimes connections happen through that way. And that's a great access point. Awesome, thank you. So I am just looking at the clock and I, I wanna be cognizant of everyone's time. We are at what we had allotted for time. Um, we have a couple of other slides that mostly just have pictures of what we've done in the classroom, the growing media, um, bringing that outside, testing materials outside. 
and then resources that are going to be available to you um, that that folder that Michelle has shared with me um, with resources for my classroom and, and modifying as I needed. Um, what questions do you guys have for us? And you can feel free to unmute because I, we can't really see. I, I'll keep checking Chad, the whole thing. For an average classroom, what do you think would be the cost of materials to do a unit on hydroponics? I heard $30 per child earlier, but I wasn't sure if that was for a whole unit or just what you were showing us. Yeah, great, Kathy. Great question, Kathy. So, Kathy, the $30 per unit um, for a student. So, that um, direct costs. So, the actually, the screen that the picture that's up right now, that Cultivating Roots Forage Hydroponics Activity Kit. In the middle is the virtual at home kit that I did um, as part of the virtual club this um, winter time, um, and that was that was that direct cost for that. Um, and so that doesn't include any of the larger, bigger pieces. It includes the one liter bottle kit, um, but not using recycled materials or anything. So it doesn't get, didn't get thrifty or anything like that. Um, it does include grow mediums, um, the activity we just did or just had done. Um, in the pH testing that we've talked about a little bit about and alluded to. Um, so that would very much give an individual student type experience at the $30 per student kind of a cost. And that was for over what time period? Um, it would be built out depending upon how you did it in dosages. So actual activity is a five, Five time activity time, but the grow time and extensions would be dependent upon how many, what kind of variables you wanted to test. Okay. So five weeks, and then depending upon what extensions you would want to do with like the grow mediums and seeds, because you would have, there would be plenty of seeds to do a couple rounds of testing to test Thanks. variables. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. I can kind of add to that. So from an exploratory based class, so we have a one time $500 grant that has brought us the materials to do the vertical system, the aquaponics unit, um, and the wicking systems, which I extending to next year won't replace the grant, but will be able with just my $100 exploratory funding for my school district to be able to bring in recycled bottles. We don't need to be ordering new one liter bottles. Um, so with the hundred dollars, I should be able to replace my wick and some of the growing materials that I can't just get, you know, sand and things from our backyard and um, resources around our campus that I can order online. Um, so I should be able to sustain my exploratory after my initial $500 grant um, with about a hundred dollars per year. And that is for a three day a week class and I have 15 to 25 kids depending on registration. Oops. Sorry, I hit buttons fast, but I can go can do that. Actually, I will, for those of you that were working with multiple age, um, these are just pictures of a couple of curriculums that are out there um, that do go from multiple age range. Um, the one on the far left, far left grow with a flow and the soilless grow systems are both aimed towards high school. Um, and the exploring hydroponics up on the right um, is more towards the fourth, um, fourth through sixth grade. Um, and then cultivating roots in the middle was actually the, um, is what I have, have put together kind of combining some things, combining a little bit from a few different curriculums, bringing some things together to make a, um, make a packet together. Um, and it's really aimed in that fourth to sixth grade. Um, and I have modified and done it. Actually, I had a, quite a bit of clover buds that joined me. So those are our five to seven year olds who have worked through that kit um, with me and had a lot of fun with that. So very doable for the age ranges. I do just want to share some of these pictures because Kristen has done sure. a great job with extending this beyond 
what we started with. So I think I love the pictures that she yeah. has shared. So as far as the exploratory, um, I was concerned about keeping hydroponics as a full trimester unit. And I have an environmental science degree and background. So I thought, you know, what better way to integrate real world, natural world um, into hydroponics and kind of leading directly to wetlands. So we've been out um, building wetlands, thinking about how water impacts our environment and our personal resources, our watersheds. Um, so we then extended some of our hydroponics research and went out to the wetlands to see how specific wetland plants were doing and growing. Um, again, I've been able to expand a little bit with the exploratory class, but as well, we are also doing our, our environmental science unit. So expanding through sixth grade science um, as we go outside of it. We've looked at some soil samples, talked about different soil types being the different media, grow media that's brought together and whether their soil is sandy or rocky. Um, and what that looks like both in a wetland and an upland. Um, using some of the magnifying glass that was brought to us with that grant funding uh, to really get hands in and, and deep and dirty in the wetlands, looking at some different vegetation and what the roots can look like, um, different types of root systems and how that could then impact and transfer into the hydroponic system. And then building wetlands in the classroom and bringing water resources to it, how water travels throughout our watershed. So just expanding a little bit on hydroponics and how to integrate all of this unit into um, our science curriculum in our classrooms. So I did not see any other questions in the chat. Um, that wraps it up for Michelle and I. If you guys have other questions, if you feel like you need uh, individual support from us, we are available. Uh, I think our emails are shared. Mm -hmm. And I think...